Hi everyone, thanks so much for joining us for How She Does It. On this show, we talk about all things women, money, and power. I'm Karen Feinerman. Today's show is about how to be more productive and efficient. Every woman needs that. So my husband is actually quite efficient, but I remember early on in our marriage, I one day found a light bulb burned out and unscrewed it and looked at what it was and decided, all right, I'm going to go to the hardware store and get not just one more, but the other lamp on the other side of the couch, that'll probably burn out too. And then I'll get two more just to have extras. And I told him this and he said, well, what about, where's your list of light bulbs? And I said, what do you mean my list of light bulbs? You know, the list where you have every light bulb that you need and have an inventory of it. I found that to be so ridiculous and shocking actually, but as it turns out, it's actually very productive. So similar to my husband, Laura Mae Martin has also cracked the code on how to manage your time and energy better. She's Google's executive productivity officer. She coaches Google's top executives, and she's the author of a new book, Uptime, a practical guide to personal productivity and well-being. I'd love to hear more about being productive and efficient, but I just don't want to hear it from my husband. So Laura, I am so excited that you're here today. Thank you for being here. Thank you for having me. I love that story. <laughs> Sadly, it is a true story. Uh, okay, so, so much to get to. But first, I just want to hear your backstory. I mean, you had a lot of different jobs and all different kinds of, I don't know, different kinds of places at Google, let alone before that. But let's just talk about your Google history. How did you end up here in this role that probably wasn't a role before? Yes, exactly. So I was doing all of this on the side of my roles in sales and product and event planning. Google has an awesome program where you can train other Googlers on anything, whether it's lock picking or something related to work. And so a couple of people leaned over my desk like, how are you managing your email like that? How are you always scheduling your client calls in this perfect way that allows you to follow up and send out ahead of time and things like that? So um, I just started teaching some courses on the side, email management and time management, which eventually led me to start working with executives one-on-one -on, -one on how to do those things in their own schedule. And then I ended up creating a full-time role out of that, doing coaching. And I started the Productivity at Google program, which is my scalable trainings and newsletter and, and tactics for how to get more done. So that just hearing all the things that you do, sound that in itself sounds like, wow, that is a lot to manage. Okay, so so many great things in this book. Let's get to one that spoke to me was the email inbox and comparing that to doing your laundry. Yes, <laughs> that's one. A, a lot of people have the email issue and it's really personal and they're thinking, you know, I, I have all this email and I need to do email. And so I kind of tell people, just forget about email for a second. And let's think about laundry, which we all are familiar with, whether we do it ourselves or we have in the past. And so when I say do your laundry, if you said, okay, I'm gonna take out one shirt and I'm gonna fold that shirt and I'm gonna walk it up two flights to my room and back down. Now I'm going to find this pair of pants that, you know what, it's a little wet. So I'm going to throw it back in with all the dry clothes. And I have one sock. Don't really know where the other sock is, but I'll just walk it up two flights of stairs and put it away. And you know what? I'm kind of now done with this. I'm just going to keep opening my dryer 15 times a day and see how much clothes is in there. I'm not sure where that pink shirt is. I'm stressed because I can't find it. And at the end of the day, I'm just going to start all over, start the laundry over in the dryer and address it tomorrow. So people are like, wow, that is a wildly inefficient way to do your laundry, but that is exactly how people are doing their email. They kind of pick and choose. They sort, read, and answer emails all a little bit at the same time. They never fully empty the dryer. They start it over. They have a bunch of clothes in the dryer that they don't need, AKA the emails that you're on that you never read and don't need to see. They wake up in the middle of the night, where's that shirt? Where's that email from my boss? Did I see it? Did I respond? And so it really, speaks to people because we all have opened that email and said, I don't want to deal with this right now. I'm going to mark it as unread. And that's the wet pair of pants. And so I think that a lot of people need to think about how they're doing their email and how much energy you're actually wasting. So instead, the same way you do your laundry, you want to hit inbox zero, which just means I took all of those clothes out and I put them into baskets based on what I need to do with them next. So in the email world, that's read, review, respond. In the clothes world, obviously fold, hang and match. 
And then I would say, okay, now I actually have some time set aside. I'm gonna fold or respond, get the benefits of doing that all together. And if I don't get to all the hanging clothes, I've at least seen it once. I know where it is. I know that I have X amount of clothes to hang and when I need to do it. And so just thinking through how you can mimic that process a little better with your email and waste less energy on things you don't need, things you've touched five times, and how you're doing email as a process. So how about when you do emails or how much time should you devote to emails? And we talk about whether you should do it throughout the day or not. I know you have some views on that. Yeah, that's a great question because a good system is only the first part and then it's like, how are you addressing that? When are you folding the clothes? And so the best part about a system like that is it allows you to match your energy to the type of task in the email. So let's say I'm a morning person in the book. I talk about power hours, mine are nine to 11. I really can get things done. And I have five industry articles that I got this morning I wanna read. What a waste of that spot to read industry articles, which is in general, lower energy kind of browsing feeling. So instead, what I can do is after I've split into the baskets, I can now take the morning time to really focus on things that need thoughtful responses. And then when I have 15 minutes between meetings, I might say, you know what, I'm not gonna get anything else done. This is a great time to read industry news. And so, you know, you wanna match your action to the type of energy that you have. And within your inbox, when you have a good system, it tells you exactly where to go, exactly when you spend time clearing to inbox zero in the morning. And then again, in the evening, everything you have to do, even if you haven't gotten to it yet. So it's really about the combination of finding the right time for email and then having the right email when you need it. And I think the biggest piece is just not looking at your dryer 20 times a day just to see how many clothes are in there. If you're not planning on responding to email or sorting it, then you really shouldn't be digging around in your inbox because we do that as like a video game where we kind of just want to, <laughs> you know, see what's in there just because it's fun. <laughs> right. Okay. So that sort of segues into another concept that you have is the funnel, right? Mm -hmm. Tell us about that and how that is sort of a guiding principle for you. Yeah, so I think as women, as workers, as parents, we just have that constant mental noise, those mental notes that we're thinking of. We need to buy a birthday gift. We need to send that email to our boss. We need to sign up for summer camp. And it's so it's constantly going on and everybody uses lists. They have a way of making a list of things they need to do today or a grocery list. But the point is when you have a list funnel, which starts at the top, the widest point, everything that you possibly could do, whether it's learn piano in the next five years or mm -hmm. something that's due by the end of the week, have those organized in a way that you're looking at them in a consistent basis and then funneling down to what am I actually going to do this week based on my schedule? What am I actually going to do today? What am I actually going to do in the hour? And then when I do think of that thing I need to do when I'm driving or in the car or on the walk, how do I get that back into the funnel to make sure it makes its way down and I'm not surprised by anything that I need to do? It's a pro one of the harder things to talk about audibly, but I think, you know, when you see the dashboard of the main list and I have all those on my site, it talks about breaking it up into types of action just the other day I went to a doctor's appointment I got there early I sat in the car and I thought oh I have a few minutes to make phone calls I had my main list the top of my funnel on my phone I looked at it said here are the three calls I need to make I used those 15 minutes to make the calls because that was the perfect thing to do I didn't have my computer I couldn't run errands I was just kind of stuck there and so by making that list ahead of time and having it as a locked ironclad system where everything is is in one place I knew exactly where to go and what to do Okay, so when you're dropping things into the, uh, the list funnel, you identify sort of a time frame. And so how do you break down what your time frames are? Yeah, so I, I use the funnel as a way to kind of have deadlines. So if there is an actual deadline, I'm writing that within the, the actual item on the main list. And the main list I'm looking at once a week and I'm pulling things down for my weekly list. So nothing ever surprises me. I see that thing that's due in three months at least once a week when I'm making the weekly list. So I'm backing into, okay, now I actually have four weeks till let's do, three weeks till let's do. Oh, I really do need to make time for that now. And now two weeks out, I'm preparing for it. I'm not on the week of thinking, gosh, I never made time for that. And so, you know, it's kind of that, that forward looking piece. And the other thing is when you do write something like learn piano next to something that you actually have to do today, it kind of downgrades it because you're not gonna learn piano today. You're not gonna buy a house today. And so it's, it's a way of saying, I have everything I could do and need to do, but I'm actually pulling everything realistically I will do because now my list really matters. These are high value items. Like I will cross everything off this list today. And if I don't, I'll know exactly that it's still on the weekly list. So I'm not gonna lose it because I didn't get it done. So it kind of separates things you wanna do and will do from things you actually can do. And a lot of times we mix those together on just one big list. 
if that mm-hmm. makes sense. Yes, that definitely makes sense. Okay, so this brings me to another point, which is procrastination, right? You keep seeing the the same thing reminding you over and over again. It wasn't a, oh, you had to do it today kind of thing, but it's there. Maybe just speaking, say, for a child. It's their a, a college-age child. It might be their thesis. How do you How do you move from that? So first thing, piece is kind of getting ahead of it to say like, realistically, is that the best time that I've set aside to work on something and then shifting your schedule? But then of course there are things that come up, even small things where you're just not pushing through them. Another mm-hmm. example would be Swiss cheesing it, I call it in the book. So mm-hmm. finding like poking holes. So for the thesis statement, I think it just feels like, wow, I have this huge thesis to do. And so if you keep writing do thesis on your notepad, your brain sees that and thinks, gosh, that's so much. And so instead what you can do is say, I'm just going to open the document and title it. And so that could be the piece that you kind of poke holes all the way into that feels light. I can do that. My brain can get over that. And so if you say my task for tomorrow is just opening the document and naming it, maybe writing one sentence or maybe just writing three pieces of the outline. So what happens is your brain kind of moves past that like thesis dauntingness Mm -hmm. and moves into outline or naming and then you write four things about the outline and then you're like, oh, I I might as well draft the first paragraph. And then in another example I give in the book is stopping in the middle of things. So instead of stopping at the end of each thesis section, you're saying, okay, now I'm actually gonna stop here because I know what I'm gonna write next. And then when tomorrow, when I start writing, I'll go back into the flow really quickly instead of another starting hump to get over. And so there's lots of ways to kind of break down into what is the smallest possible way I can get started that my brain is accepted and then move on from there. Mm -hmm. Okay, so this stopping in the middle sort of made me think about, it it sounds like you think of that somewhat differently. This is not multitasking. Because I think I came to the conclusion after being sort of a, you know, diehard multitasker, that multitasking is actually an enormous waste of time. As you switch from one activity to the other, you backtrack, and that wastes a little bit of time. So stopping in the middle sounds different than multitasking. Yes, exactly. So stopping in the middle is more about flow. Like you want to stop somewhere where your brain knows what's next, because then when you pick it up, you know what's next. So like in writing this book, I would always stop in the middle of a chapter that I had already outlined, because then when I had another writing block, I'd kick right back into it and then start the new chapter instead of saying, okay, new chapter. So that created that big hump for me. And then mm-hmm. the, the piece about multitasking, I'm like a, I'm a monotasker. And so the one exercise that I have in the book that I love, which you hit right on the, the nail on the head with that is the switching cost. And so if you write the word multitasking, time yourself doing this, if you don't believe multitasking is, is holding you back, you time yourself, you write the word multitasking, and then underneath it, the numbers one through 10, stop the timer. Flip the paper over, basically, so you're not copying, and then you write letter number. So M, one, U, two. You stop the timer. (laughs) It is unbelievable. I do that at a lot of my speaking events. How much longer it takes for the exact same result on either side of the paper. The output is the same, but because you were, your brain had to go, what's a letter now? What's mm-hmm. the next number? Instead of focus on one thing, then switching to one thing one time. I mean, that one data point for yourself is just totally revolutionary as, as you know, far as how should I be emailing and paying attention to meetings and looking at my kids and on my phone. And it's just, it never works unless the one thing you care about is not something you care about the results. So I can wash dishes and listen to a podcast. You know, if the dish isn't perfect, it's not going to affect my, my overall well-being. <laughs> mm-hmm. that, that is a great example. Okay, so let me just ask you a couple of things about your job. So you work in the CEO's office and you work with sort of the highest level of executives out there. Now, without naming names, do some of them have, I don't know, tendencies that are less productive? And are they open to hearing how to be more productive? Yeah, I think the funny thing is, is a lot of people assume like, oh, executives are going to have totally different problems that they deal with. But a lot of times it's similar to you. I get a lot of emails. My schedule is packed. I want more time for vision and creativity and thinking. And I think one of the coolest things about my job is that, you know, nobody is struggling with every piece of it. It can be like, I'm really on top of my schedule, et cetera. I just need a little help with email. And so when I'm working with these people, I'm also getting their productive tendencies and learning from them. And, you know, I talk about some of those examples in the book, like one Google executive, he just mastered 
urgent. And he had that idea of having an urgent block on his calendar. I learned that from him. I've now taught it to a ton of people, but every day he had the same block for anything that came up. And his team, it was crazy to see his team kind of say, okay, we this came up. We know that he's gonna be able to talk at one because that's the same time every day. So we're all gonna clear our schedules by one. By 1245, we're gonna have him a brief about what's going on. Just And it was just such a good system for something that is urgent and just feels frantic to people's minds, but he had kind of like mastered that flow. So I feel like one of the best parts of my role is seeing some of those best practices that they're already implementing and then sharing them widely. Okay, so one of the things that I know top executives or many people, no matter the hierarchy, have this sort of crush of meetings. And you address the way that you try to limit those meetings. Tell us how you do that. (laughs) As you probably got in the chapter, I'm so passionate about meetings. I think it's like part of my brand internally and externally. But uh, I talk about the story of one of my coworkers saying, oh, I wanted to add time to your calendar, but I knew you'd decline if I didn't write out an agenda. So I've been meaning to do it. And I just kind of laughed because I was like, is that the vibe I'm giving? I'm actually glad because that means I've set the right boundary. But I think the point about meetings is they, they should be an excellent use of time. Anything less than that is not acceptable. And so whether you own a meeting or you're in a meeting or it's recurring meeting or you've always had a meeting and you don't know if it needs to be a meeting anymore, I think it's just like taking that time to really analyze your meetings, whether it's how frequent they are, uh, how long they are, how a structured they are, what's the purpose of the meeting? If it's just information sharing, is that why is it something that can't be done over email? How many people are in the meeting? There's just so many ways that we can look at our own schedules and meetings we hold. And I think the point about meetings is that it just tends to be the biggest crunch. It tends to be the biggest time suck. And so I think when you take that lens at your own meetings and meetings you're in or meetings you own, it helps you to find those little, oh, I'm gonna cut here 30 minutes, 15 minutes there, and now you're feeling light and more on top of your workload. So do you think that sort of meetings have just become out of control in a post-pandemic Zoom era? Is it because it's so much easier than it was? Yeah, I certainly think a couple years ago that was the case because I think people were moving back to hybrid and then it's, do we need this weekly check-in with our team? Because now we're seeing each other again in the office and we had that set up to bridge some of the gaps. So I think that no matter what the, the point is to take a look at your meetings from that bird's eye view often. So I call that zero-based calendaring. Same thing in your closet. Walk into your closet as if it's a store. What would you buy right now? And everything else probably you're just holding on to because you always have. And so in the same way with meetings, you should think about was this a pandemic check-in that we were doing? You know, now that things have shifted, do we really need it? When our team was sh- was when our team was growing, we actually needed to talk more often, and now we don't. Or now that we're on a newer project, we need to meet more often. And so I think just constantly asking yourself, I like the trick of only scheduling like a certain number of recurring meetings and having it end because it forces you to say, am I going to put this back on the calendar for the same group of people, the same time, the same frequency, because it it makes you reevaluate. It's kind of like our, you know, TV subscriptions where it's just like, oh gosh, I forgot I was paying for that and I don't even watch anything there. So you want to be careful of that. Okay. So you talk about how you've turned down meetings because they don't have an agenda. I would imagine you've gotten a little bit of pushback over time. Like what, like people are insulted yeah. that, yeah. How do <laughs> so you I, deal with that? Yeah. So I am known as being a shark about my time, but I'm also known as being really friendly because especially when you're just communicating over email with someone and you just decline the meeting, you know, you kind of risk lowering your social capital by being that person who just declines. So I don't just decline. I say, hey, I noticed there wasn't an agenda. Do you mind if we start coordinating over email? And if we feel like we need to meet, we can go from there. Or do you mind adding an agenda so I can make sure we're talking about the right thing? And if not, I'll direct you to someone else. Smiley face. I'm a big emoticon (laughs) person. But, you know, I think it gives people the vibe that I'm being intentional about my time, but I'm also open. I'm not just declining meetings left and right. I'm just really thinking about the meetings I do accept. And you can think about if someone's done that to you, you probably respect them more because of it. You probably think, wow, this person is really intentional about her time. She really wants me to make the the best use of the time we have together. And it makes you kind of like up your game. And so I think that it's okay to do that as long as you're doing it in a way that's not upsetting people. Mm -hmm. Okay. So One of the things that you really focus on, aside from meetings, is what you call power hours, right? About how to structure your day around the time where you're the most productive. 
Yes. I think that comes from the idea when not all time slots are created equal. So if I'm saying, oh, I, I have been blocking an hour and a half every day to work on something and it just keeps not getting done or I'm sludging through it. And so sometimes I ask people, oh, when do you do a lot of your focus work? They'll say, oh, uh, nighttime. And I say, oh, are you a night owl? And they say, no, I'm actually a morning person, but I have meetings all day. Okay, well, you're not going to you're not going to be energized at night. You're not going to produce your best work. That hour from 8 to 9 is totally different than the hour from 8 to 9 a.m. and you would have gotten way more done at that point. So, I think that you can just keep a pattern. I tell people just keep a post-it at your note and anytime you feel like, "Wow, I'm really in the zone. I'm really focused." Just keep a note of what time that is, what time in how you're feeling, what's the time of day. And you really start to narrow down on what are those few hours I really get things done. One executive I worked with, she realized that hers were really like 11 to 1 or 10, 30 to 1. And she was like, I always am just like, that's when I'm, my coffee's hit, I'm in the flow. And then she realized she kept taking a break at 12 for lunch. And she was like, this is so crazy. I was dipping into one of my best hours of the day to eat lunch when I wasn't really hungry. I just thought like everyone eat lunch at 12. So just by moving lunch to 1245 one, she was getting so much more done, you know, in that day. And it doesn't have to be perfect. As you mentioned, you don't have total, you can't decline a meeting with your manager because it's during your power hours. The point is that if you can have some of those times blocked, maybe even one to two days a week, you have that feeling of, okay, I, I have time to get things done and it's my best time to get things done. And you rely on that on a consistent basis and it keeps you from feeling like, when am I gonna do stuff? Because you have those slots and they're your best slots. Mm -hmm. Okay, so all, you're busy, you have children and a big career and all of that. You talk about a, a period of time that you call nope. Yes, what is nope? <laughs> so I like to correct people because <laughs> I'm is busy, that? but I'm balanced because balance yeah. is the new busy. And I think a lot of the language around busy that we talk about, like busy is not important. So when people come to me and they're like, you must be slammed. I'm like, no, I'm actually perfect. You know, I've got my priorities and because I think that's a good way to switch it. But yeah, I have my nope time, which I have on the calendar is like 4 p.m. on on Fridays. And it's really just a, a somewhat of a joke. But the point is I will meet then or do something then if it's really urgent or it needs to be done. But I'm aware of that. I'm super low energy at that time. And so I prepare for that. So if I have something Friday afternoon at four, I might start the day a little later knowing that I'll, I'll be able to keep energy for longer at that point. But it's just being aware of your natural rhythms. And then people say, oh, does that mean you don't work during your time when you're low energy? Absolutely not. It means that I'm doing things that are low energy during low energy time. So I have expenses I need to do every week. There are little emails I need to reply to here and there, logistics or booking travel or kind of like those headphones on, little things I need to do. If someone asked me for a coffee chat. Sure, Friday afternoon's a great time. So the point is that you know when you're low energy and you can slot the right things there. If I have a big project to do or someone wants me to do a big speaking event, Friday at 4 p.m., probably not my best self. And so just having those knowledge about where your patterns are can help you schedule things the right way. I had one time a guy work for me, really great analyst, really great, and did excellent work. But occasionally I would walk past his office and he was literally playing solitaire on his computer. So we do sort of a review, you're in review, and I'm like, you really do excellent work, and, but I gotta ask you, what's up with the solitaire? <laughs> And he said, here's the thing. I work really hard and it takes a lot of energy and a lot of focus. And there's only so much amount of time that I can do that. And then I have to rest my brain. And I'm like, okay, that yeah. makes sense to me. I'm I, so I, glad you brought that up though, because I think that managers ha have this idea of people need to be butts in seats, nine to five focus. And it's just, it's, you're not getting your best output from your employees. And I think, the pandemic did a little bit to help that because it's like if I'm someone who starts at 10 and can work till six or I need a nap in the middle of the day or whatever it is, like I'm able to really hone in on my own productivity patterns that don't fit into this like business world exact when you should be doing things. But, you know, I tell managers that all the time. You need to be looking at the macro like January to March is the new nine to five. You need to say, like, here's what I need you to do. And at the end of these months, I will look at your performance and how you're managing your time. Because if people have that flexibility to say, I'm creative here, I need a break here, I'm focused here, I'm heads down here, that is so powerful to their longevity and avoiding burnout and overall creativity versus like, how many calls did you make this hour? Mm -hmm. You know, that's where you get into the like micromanaging of it. 
Okay, so I gotta ask you, you must have seen a lot of terribly unproductive things in your day. What are the worst, the worst ones? It's probably what I do all the time, but what are the worst <laughs> ones that you just like, oh my God, that is so counterproductive? I would say multitasking, which you already mm -hmm. brought up. I think like trying to do too many things at once instead of focusing on one thing at a time. Certainly email tends to be one of the highest energy drains when you're getting a ton of emails that you don't need to see. I say like even looking at that subject to say I don't need to open it uses a, an energy point. And so that's just like a little bit of your energy that's taken away. And if you have tons of emails, you're doing that tons of times a day. Okay, so let me just stop you right there yes. for a second. Should you then go on delete, say, it's junk, block the email, go through the unsubscribe, all of that. Should you put that front end work in to put your, to, to decrease the incoming in your email? Absolutely. So I, I have that in the book, my three step plan for email. And the last step is the laundry step, which we already talked about, but the first step, and if you're only going to do one thing is clearing out the things that you don't need to see. And so one easy way to do that is searching for the word unsubscribe. Almost every email that's not to you probably says that. And so filtering for, you know, in Gmail, if it has the word unsubscribe, skip the inbox or go to my newsletters folder, setting a timer, making it a game saying, okay, in 20 minutes, how many things can I unsubscribe from or, or move out of mm -hmm. the inbox? It doesn't have to be totally unsubscribe. But if you just do that one thing, that can be mm -hmm. helpful. Just that one small piece. Okay. Okay. Yes. Um, really, really interesting stuff. Okay. Do your, are your kids really efficient and productive? <laughs> That's a funny question. Um, my daughter who's my oldest is a little more like my husband, but, um, you know, she's, she's, which is good. We're a good balance. He's more of a like spontaneity, a little more disorganized, creative. But one thing I'm doing with my daughter and she's only five, but sometimes her room gets a, to be a mess and she's like, I, I feel overwhelmed. It's kind of like her inbox. Like, what am I gonna do? There's dress up clothes, there's dolls, there's books. And so one thing that I'm teaching her, which is exactly what we talked about with the laundry is I'm just saying, don't worry about putting it all away, just make piles. And she loves that. So she'll ask me, oh, I can't clean my room on my own. Can I just make piles? So she makes a pile of her dress up clothes, a pile of her books. She doesn't put them all away. And then we go in together and I'll say, okay, I'll help you with your books. And then she comes to me and says, oh, we still didn't do the hang up clothes. We still didn't do the dress up clothes. Can we do that tomorrow? And so trying to teach those systems mm -hmm. and not necessarily like go clean your room. But then my son, he's in her room, like you need to put this away, sissy. And so <laughs> every kid's different and right. um, you know, right. you do what you can. <laughs> so you're teaching her a little Swiss cheese. Just get exactly. something done. Exactly. Last question. Is there any new research, any new studies that you've read that really have an interesting perspective on productivity? So one study I read recently was about a set of scuba divers and they were split up into underwater and on land and then they were taught things. And then they went back into some of them the same environment and some of them a different environment. So kind of switched half and half of the groups. And then they asked them to recall the things that they learned. And the recall rate of the group that was in the same place as where they learned the material was significantly higher than the group who had switched. And so I talk about that in the chapter called Hot Spots and Not Spots, which is about the fact that your brain associates so much of what you're in when you learn or when you work and what are the sights, the smells, the sounds, in this case, the ocean. And so it takes all of that information and stores it and associates it with the material that you're thinking about. And so if you want to use that to your advantage, you can pick spots that you want to do certain types of tasks. So I always email at this desk. I always code at home. I always reach out to clients or make client calls on the porch because it teaches your brain to start slipping into that type of task in that spot and recall the last time you were there. And it allows you to have those easier flows instead of switching it all up or doing everything at one spot. So I love that study because it exactly shows why you can do that and how you can use it to your advantage. Oh, that's great. It's sort of a different take on sort of non multitasking locations. Exactly. <laughs> uh -huh. All right. Really amazing, interesting stuff. Okay, Laura, you ready for the lightning round? Yes, I'm ready. <laughs> okay. All you do is just answer the first thing that comes into your head. Heartland okay. or Yellowstone? Heartland. <laughs> <laughs> First one up or last one to bed? First one up. Work from home or in the office? Work from home. Uh, would you rather jaywalk or cross at the light? <laughs> cross at the light. <laughs> okay. 
I'm a notorious jaywalker, which is a New York thing. And then you go to L.A., for example, it's not apparently not as cool. OK. Ah. Um, all right. Would you rather an unexpected snow day, which is kind of an East Coast thing, um, or you could plan for a one day longer vacation than you thought? Definitely a snow day. I'm a snow girl on the East Coast. Ah, OK, great. And there's something about the just serendipitous of it. that. Yes. Uh, um, yes. OK. Would you rather be forced to sleep with your phone next to your bed? or have a very uncomfortable mattress? I would have to say uncomfortable mattress. I am aggressively against the phone in your bedroom. So. Okay, I know you are, and that's an excellent thing. That's way up on my very long list of terrible things I do, but okay, that's good. I love that you said un uncomfortable yes. mattress. Okay, how about this? There's a three-way, stability ball chair, treadmill desk, or standing desk? I think standing desk. Okay, uh, Gmail or Gchat? Gmail. Would you rather laugh uncontrollably or be moved? Laugh uncontrollably. Fiction or nonfiction? Fiction. Okay. As a nonfiction <clears throat> author. <laughs> <laughs> what are you reading? Well, I just read your book. So. <laughs> yeah, I'm reading uh, The Woman by Kristen Hansen. I just started it, so. Okay. All right. Not a rather, would you rather, a bonus question. Okay, what have you changed your mind about in the last year? Oh, well, I love to tell the story of everything. I was pregnant while I was writing this book and I had everything planned down to the minute my other kids were born around their due date. So I thought I'll finish the chapters. I have all this work to wrap up every day. It's going to be perfect. And my son was born over a month early and it just kind of threw me for a total loop. I was like, I'm the person who talks about planning everything and this is so unplanned. <laughs> Luckily, he was fine. He just wanted to come early and I think he taught me a lesson, but it was just a really good mindset shift for me and what was important in that moment was not all my work and every plan it was kind of like making sure everything was okay and that he was here and my whole life just paused and I was like I don't care if this is late and so it was just a really good change for me to embrace and learn my own lessons about going with the flow <laughs> <laughs> okay all right and the last question what is the best investment you've ever made and the worst investment and a broad definition of investment fits here any hmm. anything I think the best investment is probably my marriage, my husband. I just feel like, you know, it's just the lens through which I do everything else. And that's so important to me. And that's probably one, one ounce of energy there just like is exponential. So that, and I would think the least investment, I feel like early on in my career, I was really focused on what people think and what's the feedback and getting, taking all that constructive criticism, but taking it with a grain of salt is what I've now learned. And so I think I over indexed on that versus just going with my gut. One example I always give is my Friday newsletter at Google has become super popular. And I had people email me at the beginning saying, don't send this on Friday, no one's gonna read it. And I kind of thought, should I shift it even though I like Fridays and it's fun. And it's just now if someone says that, I'll write back and say, oh, thanks for the feedback, but I love Fridays and I'm keeping it there and it's been successful. So I think just too much reading into what does everyone else think? And now I'm a little more confident as time does. <laughs> right, all right. Laura, thank you for being here. I loved your book, it's called Uptime, but where can our listeners find you? Yeah, so I have a website, my full name, Laura May with an e martin.com. I'm also on Instagram and LinkedIn. All right. Thank you so much. It's great to meet you. Thank you. You too. Thanks for having me.